The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes. Let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapters 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for you, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand. Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. There came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus 
and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, the, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. God has made us his own people by our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I have a kid's message, and the kids that I see are kids that I don't know, but I promise that I don't bite. So all the kids who want to come up and get a little bracelet, I have, I have a bribe for you. <laughs> come on up. Come on up. I promise. I'll be nice. Come on up. There we go. Excellent. You can sit next to me or up wherever's fine. Come on up. You can sit. I promise I won't bite you. I'm with. Hi, Theo. Come on up. No, that's okay. You can sit right there, Theo. It's okay. So today in our gospel lesson, we learned about some people who were really sick. Have you ever been really sick? Yeah. Sometimes when we're sick, our tummy hurts, and right now I have a little stuffy nose, so I'm sniffing a lot. And what do you do when you're real, when you're sick? Do you cry? Take a rest. Excellent. That's usually a very good first step. Exactly. Take a rest. Maybe you ask your mom for help. And um, my mom, when I had a, a tummy ache, she would give me Verner's. Right? And I got to stay home from school and watch The Price is Right. It was kind of awesome, actually. Um, although convincing her that I was actually sick was a challenge. Um, yeah, we've got different things. But it, and then if you're really sick, if mom's like, oh, Werner's is not going to solve this problem, then what do you do? You, maybe you take medicine. Yep, Dimetap or something like that. Yep. And then if mom's like, oh, that Dimetap it is not doing the job, then what do you have to do? 
eat soup. <laughs> that is, <laughs> we got a lot of good home remedies here, yeah. Sometimes you might even have to go to the, to the lake. <laughs> the lake solves a lot of problems. <laughs> Definitely makes me feel better. Sometimes you gotta go to the doctor, right? And the doctor might have to poke at you, maybe give you a shot. He might have to look in your throat and, and figure out what's going on, right? But there's sometimes when we're so sick, even a doctor can't help us, right? Yeah. In our story today, the two, the little girl and the, and the uh, lady there, they were really, really sick that the doctors couldn't help them. And both of them, well, the girl's family, I suppose, they knew that there was one, one more thing that they could do. What was that? They could ask Jesus for help. And did Jesus help them? He sure did. He always helps us, yeah. Now, we all are really super sick, and doctors can't help us at all. Do you know what we have? We have something called sin. Sin is bad. You are right. Sin is bad. But we all have it, and doctors can't help us, and our mom can't help us. Even Verners can't help us with our sin. But who can? Jesus can help us. Exactly. Yeah, you can ask Jesus for forgiveness. And so what I have for you today, I have a bracelet, and it just reminds us that Jesus can cure our sin. And how did he do that? Hmm, it's a mystery. He, he died on the cross, and then he rose again. Exactly. He died in place of our sins, and that washed us clean. So our bracelet that I have here today has all these colors on it, and it helps us remember. The blue helps us remember that Jesus washes us clean with the waters of baptism. And the black helps us remember that we need to be clean because our, our hearts are full of sin, right? And then it kind of turns white. It's kind of grayish, but what does the white remind us? That when Jesus washed us, the black was gone, right? And now we're white. And what did he wash us with? Red blood, you are right. So I've got a bracelet for everyone. Before we go, I have a, a, um, it's a repeat after me prayer. Do you know how to do those? Okay, so I'll say something and then you say it, the same thing. Are you ready? Can I see some praying hands? All right. Dear God, I praise you for your power over all creation, sin, and death. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to take away our sins and for sending your Holy Spirit to give me faith. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, do you want one of my bracelets?
from God the Father, whose mercies are new for us every morning, who showers those mercies to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's gospel brings us the story of two people in desperate situations. On the one hand, we have Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, whose daughter is dying. He pleads with Jesus to come and touch her, to make her well. It's the plea of a desperate man. It's raw faith that compels Jairus to break all the rules and trust in Jesus. The other person is the woman who has had this issue of blood for 12 years. No doctor could help her. She spent everything that she had. She was with the last straw that would break the camel's back. She was at the end of her rope. But she had heard about Jesus. How much and what, we don't know, but she had heard enough to believe that he could do something. But how do you get to him in that crowd? Especially when you're an outcast. Especially when you're unclean. Because of that blood, she was unclean. So she'd snake her way through the crowd and she'd get close enough because she knew she didn't need much. She needed Jesus, but she didn't need much. If she got just the hem of the garment, that would be enough. And she'd be healed. Raw faith. Not sophisticated by any means. Not sit your protoplasm in a pew in church kind of faith where it's safe and we can puff up our chest and show each other just how faithful we really are and how much we put our trust in Jesus until you walk out those doors and the game changes, doesn't it? Because you've been where these people are, some way, shape, or form. It's impossible for us not to feel for them. How many of us haven't paced the hospital room all night on behalf of a spouse or a child or a friend? We know. We know how anxious we get when we stand by and watch someone that we love in pain and suffering, and there's nothing we can do. We know what it's like to feel powerless and unable to offer any kind of relief. Cancer, weak hearts, dementia, it doesn't matter. We've all been desperate enough to find someone who can give us some hope, some glimmer, a ray of something that would make life better if we could only find it. And we would pay anything. We would give up anything. We would go to any length just to get help that's real. You've been there. You know what that feels like. You know how desperate it is. Desperate situations, desperate measures will push us to do most anything to find an answer. For Jairus, synagogue ruler. Think chairman of the congregation, chairman of the board of elders, one of the council members in a congregation to make sure things keep working as they're supposed to work. We'll hear about congregational officers and the installation a little bit. For him, it was desperate enough that he had to own up to knowing and trusting in Jesus when all of the religious leaders of the time were not so sure about him, they were pretty skeptical about him, about Jesus, that is, and they, he needed to keep his distance. That's the proper way to do things. But he ignored that. His girl was sick. She was dying, and she needed help. And he'd go to Jesus. I don't care what anybody says about him, he was thinking. I don't care what anybody does to me. I'm going to Jesus. He's healed others. For the woman, we thought 
Social distancing was something that came out of COVID. Ain't so. In polite society back then, men and women were socially distant, especially if they weren't part of your family relation. Now she broke that protocol just to get close to him. She would do anything, play the last card, just so she could get some relief. These are stories about faith. Not the kind of faith that you have right now that I know you believe in Jesus and you trust him as your savior, but it's awfully easy to do that right here in this surrounding when you're with other people who aren't going to question you necessarily about your faith. But you walk out these doors into this world that is against you because it's against the savior and the devil's gonna come and he's gonna whisper nasty things in your ear Faith always involves risk on our part. Faith is never safe. Faith begins with us admitting that on our own, we are weak and frail and we are powerless to save ourselves. And we are powerless to save those whom we love who are hurting. But faith insists. Faith, even Jesus says, like a mustard seed, faith insists that despite what your eyes may see, what the world might tell you, what you may be feeling at the moment, faith insists that God is good, that he is rich in mercy, and that he is determined to save his people no matter what. Did you read carefully that? lesson from lamentation God will bring this kind of affliction to people but there will be an end to it it's no small risk to have faith when we see all kinds of injustices and all kinds of injuries with our eyes and it seems to us in a lot of ways that that maybe God's forgotten or he's not doing much about them how easy it would be for us to be that psalmist in Psalm 73 and go home and read it today, who begins the psalm and says, you know, I try as hard as I can to be faithful to God, to keep myself out of trouble, to follow his precepts and his commands, and it seems it's not getting me anywhere. I look around me at the people around me, those who don't believe in God, who don't follow his ways, and they always seem to get all the breaks. Their lives are, are easy and light. They seem to get it all. And here I am trying to be a faithful follower of God and I get all the bad stuff happening to me. It just doesn't seem fair. Woe is me. He says, and that seems to be my life until. Until I walk into the sanctuary of God and then I compare what's going on in their life and in my life, and I see this. It doesn't matter what they have or what I don't have. I have something that they will never have, or never have, and that's God himself. And that enables me then to be faithful and to go on. Faith is never safe. It's never easy. It's easier simply to harden your heart and mock God, it's easier to stand by on the sidelines in desperate situations and smugly say that there is nothing that can or will be done. It's easier not to hope at all rather than risk having your hope disappointed again. Look around you. The people in your world, you find all kinds of people who've let their broken hearts become hard and dark, they refuse to hope, they refuse to believe, they refuse to risk anything anymore. But faith God gave you in holy baptism, the faith he nurtures in you with word and sacrament, faith is the hand that will risk everything and will hold on to God's grace despite what your eyes see or what the world you live in tells you. Faith is the hand that will hold on to Jesus when every other recourse has proven to be a dead end. Spirit-given faith in Jesus Christ 
is the hand that reaches out and will touch him as the first hope of a people who have only the word of God to go on. That's what Jairus risked to ask Jesus to intervene. What the woman went, risked to touch Jesus. Faith was the hand that touched him when everything else said, keep your distance. Faith was the confidence that believed that God was not far from her pain or her need or her despair. The risk to both of those people is the same risk we take every day. It's always easier. It's always easier when you believe God keeps his distance from you and your pain because then it's safer and more accommodating to our way of doing things in this broken world to complain about our misery rather than to hope in God in the face of that misery. Too often, we've got too many friends, Christian friends too, who act like Job's buddies. You know that story, right? What'd you do wrong, Job? Why is God against you, Job? There's too many people who are saying those kinds of things in our world. We always take a greater chance appealing to God, whom the world says is an abstract idea, and we ask him to come into our situation and be a father to us like the father to a dying child or a friend or to a woman consumed by illness. It's the same risk to believe that God's grace is bigger than my sin and his life is more powerful than the grave. The world we live in is practical. It tells us, it counsels us, make peace with death. And if life isn't what you'd like it to be, there's drugs to numb you into unconsciousness, find a doctor who will give you whatever you need to make your pain go away, self-medicate with drugs or booze or whatever, because the world insists that everything else in life, including death, finally is smarter and safer than believing God, who sent his one and only son to be your savior through the cross. That's what the world we live in says. But we must be like Jairus and this woman. If they could be faulted at all, if we could be faulted at all, it's not because he risked it all, but maybe because he waited too long to plead the cause of his daughter to the Lord. If the woman who reached out to touch Jesus could be judged at all, perhaps, because we would do the same thing, it's because she didn't have the confidence to speak to Jesus face to face and the faith to believe he would provide her with all the grace she needed. But the weakness was on her end, not his. And the weakness is on our end, too. That's why we come here. That's why we need each other in the church. Because this is the place where the truth will come out And you have the freedom to know that we serve a Lord who proved that he loved us more than life by laying his own life down for the likes of us. Here we know that we have a Savior who was willing to suffer all in order to relieve our suffering for eternity. Here we learn again and again that the innocent one is the one who paid for the sins of the guilty ones like us and where this one who gives life tastes our death so that we could be free from its grip. The message today is to do this, take the risk and believe that God keeps his promises. Take the chance and believe that he is not far from you but near to you in your trouble or your trial or your temptation. Take the leap of faith and trust him to do exactly what he has said he will do because he has done exactly that in Jesus Christ. 
Your God is not some abstract idea too far to help you in your need. Your God is not some fragile deity who cannot handle the sins or the diseases or the tears or the hurts we want to bring to him. This is not about a God who is too small, but about a faith that risks trusting in the Lord first instead of as a last resort. The truth is we're all like Jairus. We're all like this woman. Our sin has made our bodies weak and our lives fragile. It's stolen our holiness and left us with guilt and shame. It's turned our future into death and the grave sin has. But God has intervened. He has come in the flesh in Jesus Christ and he has provided the solution for all our needs, for all our wants, all our hurts. He's the first hope of a hopeless people. He's the first grace to absolve the guilt of repentant sinners. He's the first medicine to give eternity to mortals. He is the first righteous one whose righteousness is big enough to cover us all. He is the first life stronger than death. He is the first voice who will call you from the grave one day and say, come forth, it's not done yet. Come, you who are blessed by my Father with the inheritance that was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Our God is not a God of disappointment the one who keeps his promises. He does what he promises. He gives what he says. And he will give and he will be where he has promised to be. And to people like you and me, people who are often fearful of hope or being disappointed by it, Jesus says to us what he said to them so long ago, do not be afraid. Only believe. No one ever messed up because they believed too fervently, but how much we lose because we believe too little. Don't be afraid. Only believe. God's grace is sufficient, always. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that transcends our human understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ to life everlasting. Amen.